This is Colin Selleck of Binghamton University. This is a review of chapters 15, 16, and 17 of the book Dynamics by R.C. Hebler. So chapter 15.1 was on impulse and momentum. And here you can see the three scalar equations in the x, y, and z directions. Basically, this means that there's the problem has two states. You know, there's state one, then some forces act over time, and there's a state two. So at state one, the mass times the velocity in the x direction plus the integral of all the forces in the x direction integrated over time is equal to the momentum at state two. And the same for the y in the z direction. The next topic we covered was uh, impact. And you require four equations to solve these problems. Uh, basically, conservation of momentum and the coefficient of restitution equation are applied along the line of impact. In this case, that's along the x-axis. And you can see here, this is conservation of momentum before and after impact. And this is the coefficient of restitution. It's the relative velocities after impact divided by the relative velocities before impact, but only applied in the x direction. And then the last two equations are these two you see here. And that means momentum of each particle is conserved in the direction perpendicular to the line of impact. In that case, that's our y-axis. So you can use these two equations. So you have four total equations for oblique impact. Next, we went over angular momentum, similar to linear momentum, but it's uh, r cross mv. So this is the linear momentum of a particle. If you cross it with r, the distance away, and that's perpendicular distance away from some point o. And the way we use that equation as you can see here, it's very similar to the linear momentum equation. Basically, you're going to have two states again, a state one, and then some moments act over a period of time, and then you'll have a state two. So the angular momentum in state one plus the integral of all the moments integrated over dt is equal to the angular momentum in state two. Now we're moving into chapter 16. This is about planar rigid body motion. There are four types of motion. Uh, the first one you see here is rectilinear, so a line on the body does not change orientation, and a point on the body moves in a straight line, as you can see here. Curvilinear translation, a point on the body travels a curved path now, but a line on the body doesn't change orientation, so it's not rotating. And then we have rotation about a fixed axis. It's pretty obvious. And then general planar motion, points on bodies both translate and rotate. And here you see the three equations that we use to calculate over time how omega and theta are changing. These look very similar to the rectilinear motion equations. But if you have constant angular acceleration, omega is omega naught plus alpha t, theta is theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared, and omega squared is equal to omega naught squared plus two times alpha times the ch delta theta. You know, in rigid body rotation, the velocity of any point is given by omega cross r, and it's always tangent to the path of motion. And in rigid body rotation about a fixed axis, the tangential component of the acceleration is equal to alpha cross r, and the normal component is omega cross, omega cross r. And be sure you do this cross product first. If you do omega cross omega first, well, those are both in the k direction, so that comes out to be equal to zero. So you don't want to do that. You also see this second term written as minus omega squared times the vector r sub b. And defining the acceleration of any point on a rotating body, you can use this equation here. So the tangential component is alpha cross r, and the normal component is minus omega squared r. Next, we did some relative motion analysis for velocity. This relates the velocity of two points on a rigid body. So the velocity of B is equal to the velocity of A plus omega cross R B with respect to A. So a lot of times in these problems, you know, for instance, you know that the velocity of B is perpendicular to the length BC, and you know the velocity of A is in the I direction. You can use those facts in order to calculate omega or what have you. Remember, this is two equations in here because this is a vector equation, so you can solve for two unknowns using that equation. And the last part of chapter 16 was relative motion analysis for acceleration. Now, this relates the acceleration between two points A and B on a body. Also, a vector equation, so you can solve for two unknowns using this equation. 
Again, a lot of times in these problems, you know the direction of one of the accelerations or maybe directions of these two. So you use those facts to solve for alpha and maybe the magnitude of one of those accelerations. So now I'm moving to chapter 17. First, we define what the moment of inertia was and we define the parallel axis theorem. So if you know the moment of inertia about the mass center, you can translate it to any point by adding on the mass times the distance squared, where d is the perpendicular distance between these two axes, as you see here. So next we talked about applying Newton's equations of motions in the rectilinear coordinate system. So I can say that the summation of force in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration of mass center in the x, and likewise for the y. The other equation is the summation of moments about g. The mass center is equal to the mass moment of inertia about g times alpha. You can also use this equation right here if you're going to sum moments about a point other than the mass center. So you just add on this last term right here to do that. And I recommend you use the vector form of these equations. It makes it so much easier. You can see how I do this in the homework. And then we talked about rotation about a fixed axis O. And when you have that case, you can use these equations right here. You may recognize this right here. This is the normal component of the acceleration of the mass center, and this is the tangential component. And the summation of moments about O is equal to I about O times alpha. This concludes the review of chapters 15, 16, and 17.